I don't. I can't memorize things that well, so so I read <laughs> off a little bit of my uh, introduction. So one day I'll have a good memory and I can. Memorize. <laughs> okay, we're recording. All right, great. So hello, museum families, and welcome to RBCM at Home Kids, a play date through screens across British Columbia and the world. The previous sessions are recorded and you can find them on our Royal BC Museum YouTube page. And I think this is episode, I think it's episode 24. So we have 24 great videos for you to check out in our Royal BC Museum YouTube page. So my name is Chris O'Connor and I am a learning program developer at the Royal BC Museum. The museum and my home is on the territory of the Lekwungen speaking people, the Songhees and Esquimalt nations here in Victoria on Vancouver Island. I'm an uninvited guest on this territory and grateful to live, learn, and raise a family on this land. So I love museums, in part because being here, I'm constantly learning, constantly building on my knowledge, constantly being surprised. And one of the first things that I noticed being surprised by when I first started working at this museum was a particular kind of box in the First Peoples Gallery. The outside of the box seemed like it was just one piece of wood and I couldn't understand how the bending of that wood in that kind of precise way was even possible. But right away I learned that they were bent wood boxes. I started to learn the significance of the use of these boxes and the technology, tools, use of steam it took to make them, and also the connection to what is known as the tree of life, red and yellow cedar trees. So today we'll be exploring those kinds of boxes um, connected to, um, to stories and culture. But first, let's go back to last week. Um, again, it was with uh, Rain, a painter who showed us how to do meditative painting. And I'm just going to share the screen here. All right. So, um, so Rain showed us how to do meditative painting and also showed us how to do some strategies on painting the ocean that we want to see. And she also showed us some sort of nifty ways to be responsible in an environmental way with disposing of paint. So a lot to learn from last week. Um, we won't be making art, but we'll doing a making project. We'd love, well, we will, because you'll be um, coloring in as well. So we'd love to see what you come up with. Uh, so feel free to share it to me and then I'll share it to Hannah. Uh, C-O-C-O-N-N-O-R at royalbcmuseum.bc.ca. You can share it through our social media channels at Royal BC Museum or hashtag RBCM Kids. And then after, just keep exploring, connect with us at the Royal BC Museum uh, learning portal. And, and Hannah is actually, her name comes up many times in the learning portal because she was part of creating content for different aspects of the learning portal. So pathways and playlists are there. You could Google Royal BC Museum and learning portal um, and start exploring. And next week we'll be doing a, a session called Seeing and Sketching with Mitra Niku um, or Niku. And that's her in the, uh, the front of the picture there diving down. She's a science illustrator. Um, so she's gonna teach us some ways of how she draws uh, science, um, explores science through sketching, um, and some strategies on how to do that sketching. So that's next week. So I'm just going to come out of that. All right, so um, just a reminder, in this format, you can see me, their host, and our special guest. Today, that's Hannah. Wave Hannah and, and <laughs> if you want to. Uh, we can't see you. We can hear from you if you use the Q&A box or the comments section if you're watching on Facebook Live. So please feel free to ask questions as we go along. And heads up again, we'll be doing uh, a making project today. So you need something to draw with, scissors and a template that we've put up in the comments section. But don't worry if you don't have these things, not a problem. You can watch this now and then again later when you do have them. So without further ado, let's meet our special, I thought it was gonna be a special guest, but luckily <laughs> special guest. So today Super we- one. <laughs> yeah. Today we're joined by 
couch and educator, Hannah Morales, and has worked here at the Southeast Museum off and on for the last few years and also works within School District 79 up in the Couch and Valley. And Hannah is joined by Nola. Hi. <laughs> so welcome, Hannah and Nola. We're so glad you're here. Yes, thank you. We're so excited to be here. Uh, so like Chris mentioned, I'm a teacher in School District District 79, which is here in the Couch and Valley, which is actually where we're coming from you today. We are in Couch and Bay, and this is Mount Zuhalem. And so I'm a I teacher earlier, and- Hannah, that, I was saying earlier, Hannah, that it looks like a virtual background, but it's not. It's the actual, your actual background. Yes. Yes. Very lucky to get to look at this every day. <laughs> Um, and the activity that I am doing with you all today is actually from my school district's indigenous department. So that's really great. Um, and I have worked at the museum for I think the past five summers now, which is always my favorite part of the summertime. And I worked in the Our Living Languages uh, exhibition, doing different activities like cedar rose making and the Bentwood Box activity we'll be doing today. And last summer, I also got to work on the Indigenous Summer Art Studio, which was really exciting. It was the first year of that program. And so each week we had different Indigenous artists come and showcase and demonstrate and sell their work, which was really exciting. We got to see people um, doing beadwork, carving, cedar weaving, and painting. Okay, so we are going to get started. So Hannah, is that a program that will continue? Oh, yes. So um, last summer, but it, it was so great to have artists here most, most days uh, outside mm -hmm. the museum. Is that a program that will continue? Mm -hmm. Yes, we are hoping to continue it next summer. Um, and hopefully some of you who are watching this right now will be able to stop on by and say hi. We had a few different artists actually working on Bentwood boxes. So you can see one in the process of being made. And, and for everyone out there, if you are coming to the Royal BC Museum anytime soon, up in the first People's Gallery, there's a whole wall display uh, that Hannah put together of the artists uh, from last year and some of them. Yeah. Okay, so before we get started making our little Bentwood boxes, I can show you what the finished product will look like. Um, I'm just going to explain a bit about Bentwood boxes. And so Bentwood boxes are actually unique to the Northwest Coast First Nations. So you see them around BC a lot. Um, they're actually used for a lot of different unique uses. So typically they're a lot bigger than the box we'll be making today. Um, but they were used for storing, so storing clothing or household goods. They could be used for transporting items. So you might use a cardboard box today for moving, but people would use Bentwood boxes. Um, you could also use it for cooking, which is pretty unique. You might wonder how they could cook in a Bentwood box. Wouldn't it just burn up? But they would actually place water for soups or they could steam their food in Bentwood boxes by filling it up with water or their food um, and heating stones on the fire. And then they could place the stones in their box, put the lid on it and it would cook their food. Um, traditional Bentwood boxes, as Chris mentioned, they are made out of cedar, red or yellow cedar, and cedar is the tree of life. We would use cedar for everything from clothing to transportation and our Bentwood boxes. So the construction of a real Bentwood box is very similar to what we'll be doing today. You would find a plank of cedar or create a plank of cedar in a similar shape to our template. And then the carver, carver would carve grooves into the corners where our dotted lines are. And then they would 
steam the cedar until it was soft enough to bend. That's another reason we use cedar a lot is because it's very pliable, which means it's very flexible. So we can use it for a lot of different things. So traditionally, bentwood boxes were used for all of these different uses and they still can be today, but more, most commonly, bentwood boxes are pieces of art today. So our bentwood box is an example of that because it has all these different carvings on it. Okay, we are going to get started and I have my niece Nola here to help us do that. And so our first step is going to be coloring in our bentwood box. And so if feel free to have creative freedom, you can choose whichever colors you like. If you want your box to be a bit more traditional, you can use lots of reds and blacks um, to help color your box in. Um, I'm going to start with this figure here. And I'm going to use reds and browns for the face, and then I'm going to use blues for the salmon on the bottom. Which one are you going to color in, Nola? That? Oh, you're going to do the same one? You're going to do the face for it? Okay. You can choose any color you want. I'll try this. Sounds good. A nice light brown. So Hannah, you said the first box has a salmon and a face. And what are what are the other what are the other yes. images? Okay, so our Bentwood box is actually going to help tell a story that Noah and I will tell you in a bit. So all of the different characters on our box is characters from our story. And so this box here represents the people of the Couchin Valley because we're coastal people and we lived off of um, fish and seafood. So we have the salmon and the person. Here we have salmon. Here is a orca or killer whale. This one's the sun on our lid. So this is our lid. And then this one is a little bit tricky. Some people might think it's a eagle. Some might think it's a raven, but it's actually a thunderbird. And how you can tell that it's a thunderbird is that you look for the horns on top of its head. Those are unique to the thunderbird. And a thunderbird is a supernatural creature. So that means that it's not real, but it's used a lot in indigenous stories. They're very big creatures, very powerful, and they're called a thunderbird because we believe that the sound of the bird flapping its wings creates the sound of thunder and that it can shoot lightning from its eyes. So those are our different characters on our box and you'll be hearing a bit more about them later. Hmm. And so the killer whale as well, you were saying, is there particular, well, I guess we'll hear with the story, particular significance. Of the yes, um, we believe that killer whales are very powerful beings and wow. you'll hear more about that. Yeah. Um, it's actually really exciting. We actually saw killer whales in the bay just the other week. Oh, wow. This was really cool. So we see a little bit of water behind you, so we'll keep our eyes up. Yes, yes. There are some <laughs> trees, but you might be able to spot one. I'm going to let Nola be the main artist. I'll try to keep up with the coloring. <laughs> um, but as you're coloring, you might notice that there are some different shapes within the different characters. And so in Coast Salish art and in lots of different indigenous artwork, um, we use a style called form line. And so within form line, you use a few different elements in all of your work. 
And so those elements are trigons. And you can see those really well on the sun's rays. So there are, kind of, sorry, Hannah, so is that kind of like a triangle, but like a... Like yeah, a it's like an form. inverted triangle, kind of. Uh -huh. Has lots of curves on it. And then there are crescents, which I kind of displayed here with my salmon's gills. They are like a crescent moon shape. Nice, Nola. And then there are U shapes, which you can kind of see. Hopefully, this one's not blocking it. Um, in our Thunderbird's wings. Do you want to quickly just uh, color one of those? Just oh yes. Pop out. Well, let me pick my color. We'll do brown. All right, I'm colored in the U shapes right there. Kind of see them. So far, my... there's the crescent and the U shape. And what was the name of the first one? Trigon. Trigon. And then we have our wow. final shape, which I will color in. And then I'll show you all. The form line is kind of like a, like okay. it helps shape the, the um, the ways that people make art. They're they're inspired by those those shapes. One yeah, that's... yes, you'll see them lots in different indigenous artwork. And so our last one is the ovoid, which we don't have many examples on these guys, but our thunderbird's eye. Usually, ovoids are used for eyes because they're just like an oval shape. It was like the top of the eyes on the sun. Would those be ovoids? Oh yeah, those ones work for ovoids. Yes. Um, so for form line, it uses a lot of positive and negative space. Mm. So a good way to think of that is that they use it in carving a lot because the negative space is actually the sections that the carvers will carve out. So if you're ever at the museum or looking at different totem poles, you'll often see these different shapes and they're the sections that are carved out. Mm. Okay, we're gonna do a little bit more coloring and then we're gonna share a story with you. And then once you're done coloring out, then you just cut, the, cut that out and then yes sorry i'm looking at time right now and i <laughs> um yes so once you're done coloring um one thing you might like to do is if you have a brown you can color in the background as well to help make it look like it's made out of cedar but no worries if you don't have time to do that you can always do it after um and so yes once you are done coloring feel free to cut out the shape of our template, you're going to be cutting on the solid lines. So we're not gonna be cutting out each individual box. You're gonna be cutting out the shape and the square. Okay, Nola, should we share our story? And then, sorry, Hannah, but right before that, so it looks like then you glue those little tabs together? Yes. Um, so once you are finished cutting out your shape, you're going to be folding on the dotted lines. You're gonna be folding it so you make sure that your pretty pictures are on the outside of your box. And this will be the bottom. So you'll fold that one up and then you'll place glue or you can use tape loops if you just have tape. And then it'll help you stick everything together. Hopefully I'll be able to help demonstrate that section. But first, we're going to share a story uh, while you're coloring or while you're cutting out and completing your box. Okay, so this story is of the Thunderbird and the Killer Whale, and it takes place in Couchin Bay and on Mount Zuhalem, which is why this is a story that I really love. Okay, ready, Nala? Yep. Okay, so life along the Couchin River was one of plenty and good fortune. 
for the couch and people. The couch and bay and Sansom Narrows were full of octopus, crabs, seals, and sea urchins. The beach was full of clams and oysters. The mountains were bountiful with wild animals, berries, herbs, and roots. The Couchin and Cook Silo rivers were rich with salmon, trout, and steelhead. <laughs> However, there was one time in history of the Couchin people where the rivers went silent of the sounds of salmon splashing up the rivers. The Couchin people realized that something was wrong and they got in their war canoes to go to the mouth of the river to see what was the problem. At the mouth of the river, they discovered that there was a supernatural killer whale eating all of their salmon before they got to come down the river for the people. The Couchin people banged on the side of their canoes in hopes that it would scare away the killer whale, but it did not work. The medicine people of the Couchin villages joined together to call upon the powerful support of the Thunderbird. For four days and four nights, they called for the Thunderbird and soon it appeared and it got in a battle with the killer whale. The Thunderbird was victorious though and it picked up the killer whale and placed it on top of Mount Zuhalem, and the salmon run was saved. Yay! <laughs> well, that's our quick story. And so this is one of the oldest legends from uh, the Couchin nations. And it's also a story that is shared in lots of different Pacific Northwest Coast nations. Um, and so if my version was a little different, that might be why. Um, and so oral stories is how we make sure that our histories and stories are kept on for future generations. And our work also helps us remember our stories, just like our Bentwood box, because it has all the different characters from it. That was amazing, you two. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> and I imagine also when you look at um, to hear them behind you, that sort of seeing the story within the landscape too, right? Yes, yes. Whenever I look at Mount Zahalem, I always think of that story. Yeah. Okay, so Noel and I are just cutting out our box right now. If you are at that stage, feel free to cut out your box as well. And if you're not, don't worry, keep coloring and you can always look back at this after. We got to have a comment just saying that uh, stellar job by Hannah's assistant for the story. <laughs> I agree. <laughs> okay, so Nola's just going to keep cutting out hers, but I'll use my blank one as an example. So you should have two pieces. You should have a piece for your box and then a piece for your lid. We're going to start by making our box. Nola, do you mind helping me with mine? Nope. <laughs> okay, so our first step is you're going to fold on the dotted lines, especially the glue tabs. Don't forget those. And Hannah, you could probably use any kind of paper, right? It wouldn't need to be um, cardstock paper. It could just be regular paper. Right? Yeah, it can be regular paper. Cardstock is really nice to use because it's stiff. Noel and I are actually just using normal paper today. Yep. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we're gluing all of our tabs down, or not gluing, folding all of our tabs. <laughs> and then Noel and I are actually going to be using tape today. Um, if you're using glue, simply put glue where it says glue and You'll ad adhere all the pieces together. We're going to show you with tape. So you're going to 
simply fold up the bottom and attach your sides. So Noel's gonna put a piece of tape right there. We have one side down. And now we're going to attach the bottom. We're gonna use tape loops for ours and then. And we're on our last side now. We're gonna need one. <laughs> and then one on our final side. All right, so we're going to attach our last side there and then close up our box. Ours is a little crooked looking, but that's okay. <laughs> Not need to be perfect. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. So here we have our box base made. And now we're going to move on to the lid. And so the lid is a little trickier. So you'll actually notice that there are little dotted lines. You are going to cut little slits on those dotted lines, just like this. So you have a little tab right there. Want to do those, Nola? Yes. Um, traditional Bentwood boxes are actually watertight, and so that means that no water will escape them. Ours might not do the job, but... You might not be able to do cooking. In there. <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah, spices, Nola said we might be cooking <laughs> items we can do. That's a great idea. <laughs> Just not water. Yeah. <laughs> and then you are going to fold on the solid lines. So it's a little opposite from the base of the box. We're going to be folding on solid lines. Okay, and our last step is if you are using glue, you will glue your little tabs here. So kind of looks like a little square, but we're gonna be using tape. And so you fold in your sides, and then you're going to, oops, sorry, my fingers, you're going to glue it together. So you fold down and then you fold over the little tabs. Yes. I think we can just use tape pieces. It's going to be a little bit easier than tape loops. And I imagine if people are using glue, you might need to just hold it there for a little bit before, just so. It's yeah, especially if you're using cardstock, the glue can be a little bit more tricky. Um, but usually holding it for a bit just helps it stick. All right, two more pieces I'll have now. have glue, then that's great, but if not, that's okay. Yes. Yeah. You two are an amazing team. Oh. <laughs> Last one. It does help to have two hands helping you with this part. Yeah. <laughs> And here is our lid. Unfortunately, we didn't get to the coloring stage. <laughs> there you go. And then your lid should fit right on top. Nice. And then here's a colored version. <laughs> <laughs> and Nola and I were talking about all the little treasures you could put in here, like money or jewelry. Jewelry, yeah. Ah, yeah. I was just thinking, like, if go for a little, like, nature walk, if I find little, like, acorns or little leaves, I could, could put that in there too. Yeah, that's a really good idea. Okay, and there you have it, a little Bentwood box. Oh, that's so great. <laughs> Thank you so much. Oh, you're welcome. Ah.
in the last couple of minutes, if anyone has any questions, either on Facebook Live or, or in the Zoom room um, for both Hannah and Nola. Do you have a Bentwood box uh, in your home? I don't, unfortunately. Um, I have been on the lookout for one for the past yeah. few years, but I haven't been able to find one. Usually, I think those are commissioned pieces, so you have yeah. to ask an artist. For sure. How, so how long would that take, that process of making a box? Ooh. Okay, I can come to my shores. Um, I, I guess it depends on how skilled you are. I did talk to one of our artists, Kevin Cranmer. Right. Um, he's from North Island. Um, and he's quite skilled. And I think the process of making the box itself would only take a few days. But it's the carving that would take much longer. Right. Yeah. The carving of each panel. Mm -hmm. So you, the what box that we, we made told a story that was mm -hmm. um, and that fantastic story. Mm -hmm. Usually the Bentwood boxes tell a story with each panel, that each panel sort of tells a, a sequence of a story. Or is that not always the case? It's not always the case. Um, I think even more so um, in contemporary pieces, I think it really depends on what the artist chooses or what the artist has inspiration for. I know that not always it has a certain meaning. Maybe they just feel like carving certain figures. Um, but there are certainly some that do have stories incorporated. Right. I'm thinking of the, the artist, Marian Nicholson, whose artwork mm -hmm. is amazing, but she has this work that it's this glass box with light in the middle of Bentwood box, or it's like inspired by Bentwood box with light in the middle that emanates out into the room. So it's like, mm -hmm. I guess there's lots of artists that are using Bentwood boxes as a, like actually making them or being inspired by them to, to, mm -hmm. tell, to tell stories and share. Yeah. Stories. Well, um, so we have a couple comments. Uh, Melissa says, that was such a fun activity. Thank you, Hannah and Nola. And then no. Marty says, wow, very interesting. Love the story. Great job. Oh, thanks, everyone. <laughs> We're really happy to be here. Yeah. So thank you so much, Hannah. Thank you, Nola. Um, it was such a pleasure both to, to learn about this activity from both of you and see you do it, but also to, to, to hear that story and see that story come alive, both in the way it was told, but then also the, the puppets as well, just to, it really, it, it was um, a real pleasure to listen to. So thank you. Oh, well, thank you. And uh, look forward to seeing you sometime soon. Yeah, for sure. Right. Thanks everyone. Bye. Bye. <laughs> so with Liz, just, finish the, just stop the recording on Facebook Live.